we meet again in public, virtual public. Exactly. Very good. Happy about that. I love it. So you, well, thanks for um, doing this. I'll wait a little bit while people show up. Our, 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 our shared friend Marinella Senatore is with us. Very good. <laughs> Shall um, we wait a few more minutes? Yeah. Uh, hi, Jay. Hi, Sharin. Hi, Christina. Hi, Kia. Hello. Hi, Damani. Hi, hi Jennifer. Marinella. Oh, Marinella in the dark. <laughs> Jay. Hi, Nato. Hi, Marinella. Hi, everyone. And I'm... Hi, Juan Carlos. Hi, Jennifer. Hi, everybody. Hi, everyone. Marinelli. Hi. Hey, Jeremy, you can say hi. Hey, uh, Marinelli, you had a nice first class. An amazing first class. What a group, amazing group of people. I'm super, super happy about it. Oh, it's awesome. I love that. I love that. Oh, look at that. Shirin and Jay, you share a ceiling fan motif. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Hi, Amber. I'm in Florida. It's hot hey. down here. I believe it. So I've heard about Florida. Ooh, one of my favorite styles. Eliza, I love, I always love the mobile tuning in style. Maybe I could do that sometime, do a visiting hours talk while we just walk, me and me and PLE, you can walk and talk. Maybe all of them should be mobile conversations. Um, well, I'm gonna wait a little bit while people show up. I hate doing the intro and then it's like, you know, okay. uh, you know how like a lot of things, when you do these visiting artist talks, like they give time for people to show up. But in the virtual, but in the Zoom, we're like here. We're like, we're just like here. <laughs> yeah, we're here. You know. Uh, oh, Shen Shen, hello. Amit, hello. Our, our, oh God's killer people. I love this school. I love this school so much. Um. All right. Hey, while we're Shen. while we're just kind of hanging, um, anybody seen any art shows or anything? There's an art show today at um, my flipping Chestnut Street. This place called um, the Decades. I want to go. Then again, I don't know if I want to go, but I might go. Yeah. Later. Dude, you just you just repeated what my brain is like for every art show. I want to go. I don't want to go. Should I go? <laughs> <laughs> uh, hi, Allison. Hey, everyone. How you doing? Hey, welcome. Good to see you. Sorry, I'm not seen. I'm just not in a place where I can right now. Don't worry about it. It's all okay, good. Okay, thank you. I appreciate no, it. No judgment. Hi, Irma. Okay. Hi, Tricia. It's good to have everyone here. Hey, so um, Amber, are we going to switch to like the speaker view style or whatever that is, or we're we just going to wait till we start? Is that how we do it? Yeah, we can uh, switch to the speaker. Let's do that. We're, we're going to wait a little bit longer just to get people in. I know it takes a little bit. Exactly. Uh, yeah. yeah, I got you. Okay. I also made you host, so you have host abilities. Hi, Trisha. Hi. How you doing? I'm good. How are you? Great. Hi, Gina. Where are you at, Gina? She's like, I'm at work. I'm secretly in this. Oh, you are. <laughs> <laughs> I won't tell anybody. I'm on the clock. Remember that Prince song, uh, Raspberry Beret, where he's like, ah, wait, seems like I was busy doing something close to nothing, but different than the day before. That's how I think about work. Um, okay. All right. Well. Nato, I noticed I, I made you the host, but if you want me to be the DJ, you need to co-host me. Oh, yo. Okay. I do. I do watch that. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not very good at this. Okay. Hold on. Co make co-host. Yeah. Awesome. Hi, Teresa. Look at Gina's. I love loving this Gina shot. She's like, can I help you? She's at a coffee shop in Philly. 
All right. Hey, let, oh, now let's get started. All right. So welcome everyone um, to our first visiting artist talk. And um, honestly, Pierre Luigi, I must say that you're you're back due to popular demand. Uh, You've already spent one time with Marinella Senatore's class, such rave reviews that we thought we'd bring you to the larger uh, platform of our school so we could engage in a conversation. I'm gonna do a little intro of you and then um, um, we're gonna do some chit chat back and forth, talk about what you're up to. And then we'll ask, some, ask for some questions from our esteemed artist community here. Um, <laughs> So we are with Pierre Luigi Sacco, professor of cultural economics at the University of Milan, senior researcher, meta, oh my God, he has so many, and part of the senior researcher meta lab at Harvard and visiting scholar at Harvard University. He's a special advisor of the European Commission for Education and Culture, member of the European Research Advisory Board of the Economics and Culture Committee of the Town Ministry of Culture, of the Advisory Council for the Research and Innovation of the Czech Republic and the Advisory Council of Creative Georgia. He works and consults internationally in the fields of culture-led local development, development and is author of more than 200 papers on peer-reviewed journals and major international scientific uh, publishers. I wanna say this about you, if you don't mind. And you know, um, there's a lot of work that's done on the uh, impact of the arts and culture on cities and nation states and just the world at large. And many of them have used data from tourist numbers, to uh, housing prices and various kind of indicators that often run counter to the goals of most of the honor artists and culture makers that are participating in this. Of course. And so I am so pleased to have someone who not only has the stomach to navigate governmental bureaucracies, but also the due diligence to take culture seriously enough to put some real numbers in people for a broader sense of what the arts can do. Um, with that in mind, Pierre Luigi, welcome. Thank you very much, Nato. That's a real pleasure to have this opportunity. It's great to have you. Well, first of all, where are you? Well, I am in Pescara, which is a small town, which is my birthplace, by the way, and there's a small town on the Adriatic Sea. So I'm just returned to live here after 30 years. And for the first time in 30 years, I'm in a, in a city with a seaside, which is fantastic. Don't make most of us jealous. <laughs> it was only due to the last hurricane that we briefly had a seaside in the middle of our town, but then uh, that, that relented. Um, you, um, I know that you kind of relocated for work and such, but um, you know, in terms of your investigation of culture, and its impact, because I think that's what we're going to dive into significantly. What got you interested in that field in general? Well, you know what? I, uh, that, that's, that's an interesting question. Um, the reason why I became an economist is quite curious. I have never heard of economics before I started the university, but I was really interested in, uh, let's say, meaning, social sciences, uh, and really lots of stuff ranging from, let's say, physics, philosophy, arts, and whatever. But the only course that I could find that really had a real mix of everything was in a business school. So it turned out that uh, then I graduated in economics and then I started a career, but as soon as I could, uh, I changed my mind because uh, it's maybe it's a kind of destiny because when, when, when I won my first uh, position as an assistant professor, it was in Florence. Then the second one was in Bologna. Then my full professorship was in Venice. So, you know, it was a kind of destiny just telling me to just look at that. I mean, when you are in this uh, heritage cities, you, you, you start uh, thinking of culture. And the point is, what is really interesting about culture is that uh, nobody really pays attention to it. I mean, in the, in the economics profession, if you tell people you're a cultural economist, they think you are interested in the role of, let's say, social norms and conventions or the anthropological uh, in sense, background of people in influencing their behavior. They can believe that you can be interested in something like the visual arts or theater or whatever, because they say, I mean, what was that? I mean, that, that's not serious stuff. So um, I started to be intrigued by that because I understood that, I mean, I really felt that um, th this aspect of human existence, uh, apart from, of course, your professional interests, but this, this aspect of human in existence is 
obviously so deeply engaging and so transformational that if you study behavior, for example, how can you ignore that? So I, I basically my question was, what is so special about, about arts and culture in human existence? And how can I, in some sense, uh, understand better how this makes the life of people different? And this is where it all started. Uh, and uh, I must say that uh, it's taken a long time. I mean, I, I've, I've been really thinking for, for, for years and working on so many different capacities uh, to, to start to have an idea of this. But just, to give a, just to give you a sense, I've really been toggling between, let's say, the more research-oriented stuff and, let's say, field work. For example, in the 90s, I participated in the artist collective called Doreste that in Italy was invited by Harald Zeman to the 1999 biennial. So we experimented with uh, new forms of relational art mm -hmm. and uh, placed, uh, let's say, a sort of a showcase for, uh, let's say, corporate presentations in the middle of the exhibition space of the biennial in the 90s, that was not particularly common. But that was really an experiment to try and understand how, I mean, culture, uh, for example, artistic production was able to shift in boundaries of perception and making, for example, certain types of social dynamics particularly interesting and, um, let's say, unpredictable. Uh, so I have always been toggling between um, research and experimentation, working on community projects and so on. And now I can say after, uh, let's say 20 years, I start to figure out why, why culture is so important. Well, so let's, um, you know, I often, as you know, the arts, at least in the United States context, but in many parts of the world are often funded by agencies that ask for the impact of the arts. And I always felt like the budget to pay for the project paled in comparison to the budget it would require to actually say what the impact of the arts are. And so you would have to come up with these figures that were baloney and all this kind of stuff because it feels like the subtlety of what goes on in a person when they experience art, particularly over periods of time, it's a subtle science that I feel like the data is very hard. And for all of you here, you know, we're starting with Pierre Luigi. I know it's, you know, we usually start with artists, but I think it's interesting to think about the subtle changes over time that the arts produce in people. They're not fake. But how does one study that? How does one get data from that? Because it, it often comes down to anecdotal evidence, but that's not enough for what you're doing. Absolutely. You know, there is a, there is a tendency to think of impact uh, almost exclu exclusively in terms of economic impact. And that's the most spectacularly backfiring strategy for the cultural field you can imagine. Not because there is not a substantial economic impact, but because you start thinking that everything that matters is what has an economic impact. So what doesn't have an economic impact doesn't matter. And uh, as a consequence of this, think of museums. This really means that you should make uh, only exhibitions on motorcycles, or uh, let's say you have to transform the museum in a sort of, uh, uh, let's say, entertainment machine or whatever it is. I mean, that's, that's not the kind of, uh, that's very misleading. Because of course, uh, in some other cases, there can be also some, um, I mean, uh, meaningful, viable um, artistic experiences that also have an economic impact. But the point is that economic impact is very much about the demand of paying customers. So mm -hmm. it's only that part of activity that attracts a, I mean, willingness to pay, which also means that the only ones that can speak their mind are the ones who are able to pay. Yeah. So, and that's very, well, you know, <laughs> that's not particularly inclusive and it's very distortionary. So the, the, the bulk of my research in terms of impact has been shifting the, shifting the emphasis from an economic uh, dimension to the social and behavioral change dimension. Think, for example, I mean, now there is a boom of research on uh, uh, artistic uh, production and cultural participation and psychological well-being and health, just to make an example. Yeah. In that particular case, you're selling nothing. So what kind of impact can you measure? Well, think, for example, of the possibility to, let's say, really change how people feel and uh, measuring this in terms of a psychological scale of well-being, there are so many, and this can be easily measured with uh, a questionnaire. 
So something, six questions that people can answer, I mean, without really, I mean, any difficulty whatsoever. Or you can even have a more, uh, let's say, substantial kind of measurements, like, for example, taking the saliva of people and measuring the, the, the rates of salivary cortisol, just to measure how stressed people are. Well, you could say, you could say okay, sounds nice, but after all, I mean, if I'm an artist, I'm not a physician. I'm not really interested in making people feel better. Sometimes I want to make people feel worse. And you're perfectly right. But uh, making people feel better or worse uh, is not exactly what we mean here. Because sometimes you, you can make people feel worse, for example, in, by showing them something that is really, let's say, uh, difficult to accept or upsetting or even cruel. But this does not mean at all that people will feel worse from the point of view of psychological well-being because these experiences can be very meaningful. So you can save perfectly your artistic autonomy while at the same time preserving the idea that uh, culturally artistic experiences can really be, let's say, life improving for people. But then the point is, okay, even if we accept this, again, I mean, I'm not a physician. I mean, I, I should not be judged on whether or not people feel better. Okay, but nevertheless, in a moment like this, in which the life of people is so profoundly shaken from by what's happening and all the societal challenges that we're facing and so on, isn't it that in some sense, I'm not saying that's a mandatory, but isn't it that uh, there is an aesthetic necessity in uh, trying to work with people to expand their possibilities to feel better and to, let's say, have a different attitude towards life, well, we, which is not self-help at all. It's really, in some sense, uh, enabling people, empowering people through the experience of meaning. So what I'm saying is that what's happening now is that we are starting to understand that certain forms of cultural participation really expand the range of possibilities of people in so many different forms, self-efficacy, efficacy, self-awareness, critical attitude. And this improves, for example, their well-being or sometimes even their health. And uh, isn't that nice? I mean, if we, if we start thinking in this regard, then I give you the floor immediately, but if we start thinking this way, just to make an example, Imagine, for example, that you have elderly people, they are desperate, isolated, and they lead a miserable life, nobody talks to them, and they feel completely useless. Mm -hmm. Then you start engaging these people in active forms of participation, and these people flourish back, because they really feel they belong, and they improve their well-being. As a consequence of this, they take like, less pills, they go less to the hospital, you save a substantial amount of resources. Why do not use these resources to finance more artistic projects? So what I'm saying that in this case, you are selling nothing or buying nothing, but nevertheless, the social impact is huge. And as a reference, the economic impact is huge because you're saving an incredible amount of money on the welfare bill and you can use it to, to make people feel even better. So in some sense, you can improve the life of people by spending less through the experience of meaning. I mean, isn't that nice? So what, what, what I'm saying is that uh, thinking of impact in this regard, we are really opening up a completely new possibility and a completely new agency for artistic production. And that's, in my opinion, is intriguing. I'm not saying that each and every single artist should do that. But I'm saying that for some artists, this can be highly inspiring and highly meaningful. Well, certainly, you know, I mean, I would wonder, and certainly I know in your research you've come across it, there's got to be examples where cities take a kind of short view policy on culture, you know, like the Richard Florida kind of housing models, where, you know, in fact, the, the, the economic models that they take up, in fact, run exactly counter to the support of the arts that they suppose. I mean, for all of us, we're familiar with these gentrification policies where so much develop goes into it, literally like eviscerating the cultural vibrancy of its city. And, and, you know, and I also think too, you know, the artist Rick Lowe, who worked in the eighth ward in Houston, who has a project called Project Row Houses, a series of shotgun houses, 
that actually also offered um, housing to single mothers to go to college while they lived amongst artist residencies. And it was, and he said something very beautiful. He said, I'm interested in a city consisting of people and not houses. And that his, you know, his economic understanding was based on the lives of the inhabitants of that neighborhood, not in the value of the property in that neighborhood. And I wanted to just to go to you, I think in terms of doing this work, you must have experienced, since you work travel in the halls of government, you know, there are, there has been a lot of damage wrought by the, the oversimplification of the implications of culture. And certainly every city person wants to think, if I just go along with the developers, everything's going to work out. You know, that fantastic question. Thank you, Nato, for this. Uh, with all due respect, I think that uh, Florida's idea of a creative class is the dumbest possible idea that you can have on the contribution that culture can give, for example, to the flourishing of cities. And the reason is very simple, because you distinguish two categories, the creatives and the non-creatives, in a moment in which you are enabling practically everybody to produce content. How yeah. can you imagine this? I mean, that, that's the dumbest possible thing you can figure out, because clearly we are in a moment in which the very distinction doesn't make any sense for the first time in history, because everybody is potentially enabled to participate. So. If this is the case, of course, if you think of a city tailored to the needs of creatives, what you are creating is stereotypes. So what do you, you, you by the way, these creative quarters are look all alike. I mean, they are absolutely the same with this uh, lofty fashion shops and uh, designer shops and cafes that really look, I mean, you, you could be anywhere. Yeah. So this has been uh, dramatic because, uh, of course, what was the, the seduction for the policymaker? The day you said, okay, I have the magic wand. Huh? Just, uh, just pave the way to creatives and the city will try. I mean, of course, uh, it's irresistible from a political point of view, but it's dumb. And of course, it, it's backfired spectacularly. So what we are seeing today is that in some sense, and by the way, Florida himself, I mean, made the, made the kind of a public apology for this. <laughs> but uh, it, it, it doesn't seem to be it doesn't seem to be really in some sense of taking responsibility for this anyway. I think he's incapable uh, of knowing what the heck he's actually talking about. Yeah, probably. Yeah. But uh, you know what? The, the interesting thing is that uh, now for the first time, the, I see, for example, in my, in my experience with policymakers at various levels, city level, national levels, uh, supranational level, you see a serious concern for the first, first time for uh, inclusion issues. Yes. And that's particularly interesting. Um, I had a personally an experience some time ago that I would like to briefly tell about because that was very, in some sense, it was really a revelation for me. For a few, a few years ago, just before the Winter Olympics, I worked in Vancouver mm -hmm. for a project that was an interesting project because by the way, it was financed by the, the bank, local bank co-op, Van City Capital. So because, you know, the British Columbia has this interesting cooperative economy and they are interested in, uh, let's say, in social integration goals. And at that time, by the way, that was highly uncommon. So we started a project in which we started a series of interviews with the, with the local creatives. That was the period in which Florida was all the rage. I mean, it was all over the place. Uh, but we started this, uh, this uh, interesting project in which we started to interview, for example, um, in, in that, that case, uh, artists and creative professionals in a city that, I mean, I don't know how many of you know Vancouver, but it's interesting because it has the downtown east side and the downtown east, east uh, west side, which are really, in some sense, the opposite poles in, in, in this sense. The downtown west side is the, is the apotheosis of gentrification. It's basically condos, and condos. And at the same time, you there is even a spot in which you have two Starbucks cafe facing each other. So that's a kind of you know incredible paradox, interesting in some in some regard. Then you have the, versus Starbucks, the ultimate yeah. city battle. No, yeah, exactly. Then you have the downtown east side, which has the poorest neighborhood of the whole Canada. Yeah. And it's literally, literally replete with the homeless people lying in the street. Sometimes uh, drug addicts are the last stage, and it really looks like you are in—I um, mean, in India. I mean, it's—it's—it's it's, it's amazing. Uh, 
And they are just there, completely abandoned. This place, uh, by the way, has been uh, familiarly called Ground Zero. But at the same time, in this place, you have the libraries and so on and so forth. And I personally saw, for example, the lines of homeless people queuing to enter the library, not to get, let's say, hot coffee, but to read the newspapers. Mm -hmm. So the interesting thing is this. We started this kind of narrative in Vancouver. Okay, you have uh, the downtown west side, which is the richest place in the city. And then you have the downtown east side, which is the poorest in economic terms. But can we make a similar map in cultural terms? So in cultural terms, what is the cultural ground zero? Of course, obviously is the place when you have, where you have the two Starbucks coffees facing each other. I mean, is the dumbest possible thing you can do. And so the point is that we started this uh, sort of collective reflection on the fact that you had the two poverty spots in Vancouver. And interestingly, the poverty spot on one dimension it was the richest on the other one. Well, to make it short, we had to stop. The mayor was so upset by this that he personally phoned the CEO of the company to say, stop this because we have the Winter Olympics. We want a celebration of culture. What is this stuff? So stop it because this is dangerous and politically, I mean, I don't like the idea at all. But interestingly enough, I mean, I still keep on receiving, uh, let's say feedback from Vancouver still now after 10 years, this conversation is still alive. What does this mean? That this idea that there is a notion of cultural richness and cultural poverty, which is so deeply in conflict with the notions that we usually take for granted when we evaluate, for example, the impact of things, is something substantial. So in some sense, there is a cultural narrative that can really give us a completely different perspective of what a city is or could become, but this is systematically ignored by policymakers. And empowering this conversation is probably today one of the most revolutionary ways to bring culture at the center of the policy conversation. And that's based also on this experience. This is now one of my priorities. I love it. And for the record, I think every artist at the school knows this already in their hearts. I mean, it only takes a cursory walk around any city to know where the action's at culturally. And it's never the high end invested tourist districts or the, the, the condo zones, right? These kind of cultural wastelands. I always joked anytime a city took up the idea of an arts corridor, it's the last place an artist would ever want to go. Um, but that said, that said, I would like to know, um, you know, I did, I had a phenomenal, hi, that's my son. Okay. Hi. Uh, hey, hey, Lies. Um, I had the, the, the um, great, okay, come on in, just say hi. Hi. All right. Got that. Hi. Yeah, love that. You know, work from home, this is dope, that's my life. Um, so um, I had the great fortune of going to Medellin, Colombia. I know that you're advising in Colombia right now, but you know, something that was really remarkable to me was this idea of these library parks. And they were these civic centers where they both had culture as well as human resources. So it was, um, and I know, and you can tell it better than I, but certainly I, in the short term, after the, after the kind of civil war and a lot of the, the drug battles and, and as well as uh, insurrectionist movements um, kind of calmed down, the cords were set. Medellin, the, the mayor of Medellin, I believe, decided to eradicate, considered the, the chief ill of society, poverty, and took the city budget and placed it in the places of the most poverty. And thus this idea of library parks emerged. But I went to them and it was amazing because it was both human and health services as well as cultural services. And I wanted, on the, on the back of that, I wanted to ask you, where have you found models that you find uh, a little more uh, indicative of the kind of thinking you have? And simultaneously, where do you think we can build from in terms of models that could be broadly brought into places like the United States or elsewhere in the world. Uh oh, he stopped, he froze. Oh, yeah, sorry, Nato, you, you froze at some point. You, you were asking, where did you, did you find models? Oh, sorry, it was me that froze, sorry. Um, yeah, I was, no. wondering, uh, um, I was wondering if there are places or things that you see that demonstrate a kind of direction where the, the, the implications of what you're saying have can hit the ground. I don't know, absolutely. There are so many places in this regard. And what is, what is interesting is that in many cases, these places are unlikely places that are relatively marginal places. For example, in a country like Italy now, the most interesting examples of uh, 
of a truly revolutionary approaches to this cultural transformation come from completely unlikely places. Just to make an example, there is a place down in Sicily. Uh, it's, it, it, it's a city that has never seen a cultural visitor in their whole history. But uh, just a couple of private citizens, they started to, and by the way, it's basically a territory controlled by the mafia. So can you imagine? I mean, that's exactly not the place you, you could consider you know, the ideal place for, uh, let's say, a cultural uh, renaissance. But <laughs> nevertheless, nevertheless. Sounds I, like a couple, great TV show for Netflix. No, no, exactly, exactly. But uh, nevertheless, the, the, there is this couple of uh, really, I mean, uh, a, a lawyer and his wife. And, and they, they came back, that was uh, their original city, but they came back after a long period of international uh, work else, elsewhere. And they started to create um, a cultural center where the idea was uh, starting to explore, for example, this new idea of a cultural empowerment from the bottom. And they started from where? From a school of architecture for children. Mm. And why is, why is that? Because they said, okay, the problem is, pri is public space. If, if the mafia controls the space, there's no chance whatsoever that we can change this because of course the public space is where, uh, I mean, uh, the community awareness uh, is basically thwarted or, or developed. But if I teach children to use the public space in a different way, it will change. And it did. That, 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 that's incredible. Just starting from a few, from a bunch of children starting to understand how to use, for example, this space in a completely different way. And of course, having no preoccupation in terms of uh, consensus or viability, simply because they wanted to play in a certain way and you, and you, you showed ways to play. Well, this has become in the, in the space of 10 years, one of the most transformational projects of cultural innovation in Europe. Now they have, for example, festivals in which you have, let's say, David Ajayi that comes there and speaks about, for example, metropolises in Africa. But the interesting thing is that this did not come from, let's say, a wealthy collector inviting people to site-specific installations by art uh, global stars. But it was really from the bottom up inviting, let's say, the grannies there to make a flea market with the local vegetables and so on and so forth. So yeah. that's the really interesting thing. So the, the way in which they created the momentum was by enabling everybody to participate in a shared vision of how, how to change the public space to make it meaningful. And this uh, spontaneously created the conditions to, of course, also welcome very, let's say, visionary transformational, even sophisticated forms. Uh, the, name, the name of the architecture program is so because it's, it's from the name of a Japanese architect that is a, that is a favorite of these guys. And the place is Favara, mm. Favara in, in Sicily. So the, the, the place is called Farm Cultural Park. You simply Google Farm Cultural Park and it speaks for itself. Oh, and, love... uh, sorry? I said, I love it. Yeah. And uh, you know what? So that's the interesting thing. You, you, you arrive at forms that are also very cool from the point of view of uh, the level of, oh, very good, thank you, Shen Shen. From the level of, of uh, artistic research and proposal you arrive at is fantastic, but you arrive there from a completely different route, which is not the usual one, which is not about, uh, in some sense, uh, buying your way into, let's say, cultural representation and excellence and so on. But it's really in terms of empowering the local community to create the conditions for this to make sense. And I think that this is the point. And South America today, Latin America, is particularly interesting in this regard because unlike the US and uh, unlike most of Europe, they had, for example, transformational experiences like, uh, for example, uh, forum theater, uh, all the pedagogy of the oppressed. Uh, so there has really been a sort of social pedagogy that has created the conditions for this. And this is the reason why today the global South, in terms of social cultural, social cultural innovation, is probably the hottest place on earth. In terms of the maturity, the social maturity, and more generally, I think that uh, this is really the moment of the global south in terms of determining the next momentum of uh, artistic innovation. It's, I think, it's pretty clear. I mean, you simply have to just look around and see what's happening. Certainly, this is not happening in this uh, sort of, uh, let's say, self secluding. Uh, dynamics that is being created today in the most conventional art world in which uh, in some sense more and more we are transforming uh, 
for example, museums in this place? I mean, is the, what, what kind of sense this has today? I mean, today we need to have museums as enabling institutions, yes. as situations where people really feel empowered to do things, to speak their mind, not to be an applauding public for the superstars. I've always uh, felt like the um, history of museums is based on collections where the, the, contempt, the museums of the future should be based on the history of libraries. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more. I think that the library from this point of view is really the model. It's, it's a model of what I could call social brokering. There is a so fantastic variety of uh, possibilities and uh, ways to combine and match the various forms of agency that we have in contemporary knowledge societies. And the only place in which you can do this for real are museums, libraries, and theaters, because there, of course, you have a, a natural arena for this kind of stuff. And uh, well, if the museum, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, that's true, Marinella, that's fantastic. I mean, I, I agree that the San Pompidou Library is more interesting than a museum, after all. And, <laughs> and also, too, if you look at the Sao Paulo Biennial, it is by far the most attended biennial in the world. And that's because they have this massive education program through, this, for the, through Brazil that brings in hundreds of thousands of school kids through the museum. And it's a long-standing um, infrastructure built on Paulo Freire's model. That is part of the governmental approach. I mean, Bolsonaro aside, it's part of the, 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 the um, ethos of its governmental structures, which couldn't be further from the truth in the United States for the artists, you know, that a lot of these artists are here in the US, but everyone's elsewhere, but certainly it almost seems insane to have the arts supported in a holistic pedagogical approach. I know, absolutely. And by the way, from this point of view, it's so sad that today there is this situation under Bolsonaro because Brazil is in many regards a fantastic laboratory of inclusive uh, cultural production and participation since ages. Not only the arts, think of music. I mean, uh, Musica Popular Brasileira has been uh, an incredible experiment in which the most sophisticated uh, musical forms were really popular. For example, Brazil music festivals were incredible from this point of view. If you compare this, let's say to Italy, let's say the pop song festival of San Remo, in which it is 90% crappy music that wouldn't belong in any reasonable, let's say musical arena, but that's just the, the market logic. In the case of Brazil, you had the most incredible uh, musical personalities also becoming popular and part of the, the musical, uh, let's say uh, societal taste at such a profound level that still today, Brazil is a musical society like probably no one, no, no other one in, in the world. So that's interesting. Um, the idea that you can have, that you can have uh, in some sense, uh, a, there is no dilemma between, uh, let's say, sophisticated, in, interesting forms of production of meaning and uh, let's say popular taste insofar as you are inclusive from the point of view of empowerment. I'm with you. Because so listen, all... just, a, just a question to you, Pia Luigi. Um, so, you know, we have a lot of artists at the school and I feel like um, it, it, there can feel a sense of hopelessness in terms of, you know, this stuff matters, but you know, you really are demonized and, and, and really isolated in terms of, you know, not only in terms of governmental structures, but even it's not legitimated on a personal level in terms of family. People think jobs do stuff, but culture doesn't. It's a very, it's a very lonely kind of pursuit. I mean, that's part of the school is just us finding company and, and, and community together. In terms of ways, you know, I do think it's important to be able to find ways to leverage the role of the arts in every city. Do you do you have thoughts or advice to the artists at the school of what they can do or ways to make an argument or how to position this stuff? Well, you know what, I think that uh, what you're doing is fantastic, especially because you are able to, let's say, really gather voices from all over the world, uh, according to criteria that are not the usual criteria of uh, overperforming in terms of professional showdown of uh, titles and career and so on and so yeah, forth. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is killing, this is killing artistic innovation yeah. because it's creating a sort of bureaucracy. Uh, that has to do with uh, lining up a certain type of uh, obliged steps in terms of museums and biennials and the galleries and whatever it is. That's bureaucracy. I mean, that, 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 that's uh, administrative sciences that has nothing to do with culture. So, uh, but unfortunately, most of the, let's say, really selective art schools operate according to this logic. 
in some sense. Like uh, top universities is the same. I mean, it's like, that's no different from this point of view between Harvard College, let's say, and, and the top our schools in the world. The point is that you are in some sense uh, affirming a new principle and this principle, and this is what I immediately liked. I mean, just uh, five minutes into my, my, my class at Marinella's uh, course, what I really liked was the atmosphere. It was completely different. It was an atmosphere of curiosity. So people were there because they were interested in what was happening there. And uh, there was no, let's say, um, let's say further thought in terms of how this will uh, make me stand out in terms of strategies and so on and so forth, which is the feeling that you immediately have when you lecture at certain types of top schools. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that from this point of view, it's really like uh, if, I, if, if I would suggest uh, in some sense, what does this imply in terms of positioning of the school? This is really to do with, uh, let's say, uh, understanding what will be, let's say, the new momentum around arts. The fact that today we are starting to really raise an awareness on the fact that arts are socially impactful and this can be transformational means that we need new forms of education around art. Yeah. So in some sense, what you are doing is pioneering this new form of education by literally turning upside down the aspects of the traditional uh, educational school, uh, educational components and educational models that uh, led to this notion of impact that we want to destabilize, to disrupt now. So in some sense, you are, you are pioneering in some sense the, the real alternative that can empower this idea of impact as a transformational social change. And now, in this regard, yeah. So, in you know, certainly one notion that's come become quite important in the arts of late, and it's, it's old, I mean, is the idea of care and a certain kind of gendering or a, a sense that, you know, and you mentioned, you know, the kind of ways in which the arts deal with either, you know, physical issues or, or biological or health issues or mental health issues, but, you know, thinking about care and the ways in which the arts can be healing or dealing with trauma. Um, it's a different way in which the traditional modernist avant-garde considered itself, you know, and I think there's a lot of interest. And, you know, I, we, I think to the artist Meryl Latterman Eucles, who wrote the Ma Maintenance Manifesto out of the kind of era of second wave feminism, but talked about the futility of domestic labor and the kind or the care that goes into just getting things to zero. And, you know, certainly I think about the different kind of notion that that implies not only in artistic forms, but the ways that artists relate to society writ large. I wonder if you could speak to that, because I also think there's a feminist and also decolonial kind of language uh, uh, kind of implied within that. No, absolutely. You know, it's interesting to remark, for example, that uh, in ancient Greece, the theater of Epidaurus, so one of the most important cultural arenas in the, in the Greek uh, uh, classical space was within the temple of Asclepius. So the, really the god of health and healing. Mm. So that's interesting because historically this relationship is extremely strong in pre-writing societies, ritual and uh, art are in some sense intertwined in very mm. complex ways. But what is the problem? In some sense, it's, it, it's a complex story. Let me make it short and, and simple. It's not, but it, it's a strategy just to try to convey the main idea. The point is that ritual is uh, deeply intertwined with the notion of healing and with the notion of social impact. But ritual is collective in a sense that is, in some sense, disjointed from the idea of authorship. So uh, ritual is something that is really community created and in pre-writing societies you cannot sign an artwork for the simple reason that you have no writing <laughs> which means that everybody can remix and change it and that sounds familiar so what happened in the in the fifth century before christ in, in in greece was something really interesting in coexisting with the emergence of democracy you needed a new kind of cultural space for a simple reason i mean in a democracy you have first to argue about your own ideas and defend your own ideas on a personal level, so you have to sign them, so to speak. And in a democracy, you have to create laws, and laws require so-called counterfactual reasoning, which means what happens if... So, how can you develop these remarkable skills out of the blue? Because basically the, the democratic revolution in Greece was out of the blue. 
Well, it was theater. And it was theater because in theater, you suddenly had the opportunity, for example, to reflect on what happens if, let's say, somebody kills his father and marries his mother. Or uh, if a woman kills his, his siblings uh, and, uh, sorry, his, his, his daughters and sons and so on and so forth. So what does this mean? It's really, in some sense, uh, the co-evolution of a form of cultural expression and a form of social organization that really fed each other in terms of creating new skills. But to do this, you require a script. So in the case of the tragedy, there must be an author. But then what is the problem? That if this author starts to conjure up these completely crazy scenarios in a ritualistic society, what is the most likely outcome? He will be killed. Because I mean, it's, it's, it's a, in some sense, it's going against all kind of social conventions you can imagine. So you have to establish a sort of privilege, authorship, that gives somebody the, 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 the right, the, the entitlement to just speculate on whatever without being punished for that. So this has been an extremely powerful tool. But what is the downside of this? That you are creating this privilege, which means that there is somebody who is entitled to illuminate others. This is what generates a colonialist vision of culture. Because for example, think of, let's say the, the, the Brits going around the world and spoiling the Parthenon of the marbles and so on and so forth. Do you think that they were not in good conscience thinking that they were in, in some sense improving the cultural progress of humanity for sure? Because they thought, okay, we are bringing this in a way and in a place that in some sense makes it safer to preserve this and makes it, let's say more, uh, culturally relevant and telling to show them in the proper context, even if we have just brought it away from the partner. Which means that if I feel that somebody is entitled to have the monopoly of meaning, you are also creating the sort of idea that there is somebody who can judge whether or not the culture of others just lies, uh, I mean, in some sense, uh, can, can, can compare. So. We, we have to understand that with this idea of authorship, let's say, and monopoly on sense making, we also bought the idea of colonialism from the cultural point of view. So, the re and that's, that's true, Veronica, that's ethnic supremacy, of course, that's the point. So now we are understanding that, of course, we have to turn this upside down, but how can we do this? without at the same time giving up the idea that there is a privileged perspective in terms of authorship. Why, how can we just pursue these new goals without thinking of a collective creation and collective authorship as a sort of natural point of arrival in this process? So the point is that we are moving towards a new context in which artistic agency creation must become inclusive because in some sense, if we are not doing this, we are not really giving up the logic that creates colonialism in the cultural production. And in some sense, this is what you see today in the blue chips of the art world. It's a form of colonialism. What they are, what they are colonizing now? For example, the suburbs where uh, you, I mean, I, I made personally a, a, a thorough analysis of uh, the monument to Gramsci of, uh, of uh, Irshorn. And in that case, you really see that there is a, that's an irony because it's in the name of Gramsci, but it's one of the most colonialist forms of appropriation of identities of, let's say, the San Francisco communities you can even think of. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, uh, that's the point. So, and uh, I mean, that, 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 that's a bold issue because it really means that we have to rethink the very notion of what does uh, authorship means today and what kind of responsibility comes with it and how this relates to power structures at a level that is much more radical and fundamental than most people tend to think. I love it. I really appreciate you diving into that. And I um, appreciate also going back to the Greeks in a short answer. It's always delightful. Um, we can go to Orpheus, uh, no problem. But listen, so I would love to turn it over to questions from our artists community. There's much to go into. Uh, maybe Jennifer, do you mind if you ask it, even though you wrote it, is that okay? Why, why don't we switch back to the panorama view so that- Okay, can we do that? Oh, Amber, can we go to the panorama views? Like, like a so? If you're still on the speaker, all you have to do is- Right, hand corner. I, I, I have it now, great, thank you. 
Thank you, Amber. Thanks, everyone. And thanks for chiming in the chat. There was a lot of good conversation there. Really appreciate that. Thanks, Shen Shen, for the quick link. Um, Jennifer, I saw you posted something. Maybe you want to ask a question first and love to hear from all of you. Pierre Luigi's got a few things to say. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, by the way, Pierre Luigi. That was super interesting um, and informative. Um, I was wondering if there's anyone, I, you know, you were talking about um, collecting data for a social and behavioral kind of aspects, but I was wondering if there's anyone out there collecting data as well in the business um, <laughs> impact that creative things have on the economy, because I was thinking about how many ideas that are coming from, um, I've been hearing from BIPOC communities, as well as like the art world generally but that these ideas are like appropriated by business and they make all these profits and it doesn't come back, you know, around through the ecosystem. No, totally. There is, of course, lots of uh, research now and, uh, and of, of course, also reviews uh, being done on uh, uh, measuring the business impact of uh, artistic participation and cultural production more generally. For example, in the US, Americans for the Arts has been particularly active in this regard, but also the National Endowment for the Arts has been uh, pretty active in this regard. In Europe, for example, we have now Eurostat, which is the Institute of Statistics of the European Union that is systematically collecting uh, impact. And uh, for example, European Commission has commissioned studies on measuring the overall size of the culture and creative economy. And you know what? It's twice as big as the automobile industry. <laughs> so, you know, there is really, I mean, and bigger than most of the other uh, sectors. So clearly from the economic point of view, that, that, that's, that's big. But at the same time, you know, if you, uh, the reason why I'm a bit shy about that is not because it's irrelevant. Of course it's huge, but I don't want to, to convey the idea that in some sense, the difference between making tires and uh, let's say producing arts and culture is in the size of the web value added that you generate. I mean, in the case of producing arts and culture, there is also this huge transformational social and behavioral impact that you don't have by making tires. And that must be accounted for. So that's the reason why I'm insisting so much on the social dimension, not because the economic dimension is trivial or minor, it's huge, but it, lead, it runs the risk of just fixing your attention on one angle and not the most crucial one. Because in some sense, the indirect economic impact of changing the behavior of people, think for example of environmental sustainability, can be way bigger. However big the economic business impact is, way bigger through, let's say, improving people's health or improving the environmental sustainability. That's why I'm insisting so much. You know, it's funny, I think it was two years ago that Goldman Sachs released a study that climate change might actually be bad for the economy. And there's an irony in it, in terms of what you're talking about, in terms of the short-term economic impact of things, where you think you had to conduct a study to say the end of the world might be bad for the economy. Like, <laughs> like you think, but it also speaks to the kind of temporal qualities of what actually constitutes economic impact. No, 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 exactly. You know what, that's, that's an interesting comparison because now, of course, environmental issues are a thing. But think of 25 years ago, everybody would have laughed at the idea that environmental sustainability should have been a major issue in, for example, designing a global business strategy or uh, not to speak of a sustainability strategy. I think that we will witness the same kind of dynamics for culture. I mean, it's less dramatic, of course, but in some sense, we will see that without a serious understanding and a serious consideration of uh, this behavioral dimension of culture and expression of because you know that we, we don't have the time to really go into this but uh, for example today we have an incredible wealth of insight in terms of neuroscience about what's happening in humans when they make cultural experiences that's that's wonderful just to make an idea when you listen to or you watch a theater performance the cardiac beat of every single viewer synchronizes. Can you imagine this? And this <laughs> I love that. I love that kind of. Yeah. And that creates a sense of community. If you sing together in a choir, literally your biofunctionings become one. 
So, I mean, clearly, this is an effect on people. And this effect sometimes lasts even when the experience is over. The point is this, if nature cared to program us so deeply biologically to react to culture, how can you say that culture is something that has only to do with entertainment and free time? How on earth? I mean, that's a nonsense logically, which really means that culture has to do with human survival. And we have the proof of this. Just to make an example, we have a longitudinal studies that really observed what happened to people over 15 years, over 20 years. And it showed that People who systematically access cultural experiences live on average 2.5 years more than other people, accounting for differences in income, education, age, gender, whatever, which means that it's only because of cultural participation. I mean, 2.5 years more is something that compares to smoking or not smoking, is exercising or not exercising. So it's really a matter of life and death. And that's just about attending regularly to cultural experiences. We are clearly missing something. Can I, put you on a, um, can I put you on a date with the mayor of Philadelphia? I really think you need to bend their ear a little bit. I'm sure many of you have mayors in your cities that you really feel like Pierre Luigi should get in their ear. Um, can, I want to, so I just want to get some more questions from folks. Veronica's asking when you're going to teach at the school. We can sidebar. It's going to happen. Me, me and Pierre Luigi already. Sorry, it's froze again. Can, you said, can you put me on? What? Oh, no, I wanted to get some more questions from folks, but then Veronica asked when you're going to teach at the school, and me and you've talked about it, so we're going to work out a deal. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, anybody else got some questions? Shen Shen raised her hand. Okay. Go ahead, Shen Shen. Thanks, Nato, and thanks, Pierre Luigi. Loved, I, um, loved all the food for thought that you shared. And I'm also taking Marinella's class this quarter. Really like Beautiful that. background. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, I was wondering if you have a list of resources or links that you can share to additional projects or initiatives, just like, you know, things that you think are innovative or effective or just like important to take a look at. I'd, I'd really love to, to do my own research or reading. Sure, sure. No, okay, I, I'll, I'll uh, okay. I, I'll put together uh, well, a not an not an overwhelming list, a list that can be manageable. Okay, I will. Thank, Thank you, you. Shashen. Absolutely, uh, my pleasure. I have a question. Um, thank you so much for the talk. It's been really enjoyable. Um, I was wondering if any of your research that you've kind of come across has touched upon the urban rural. Um, kind of divide a relationship when it comes to culture? Do you find that um, there is like cultural deserts in one or the other of the areas or, um, you know, what's that kind of relationship like? Fantastic, thank you. Thank you, Amber, very good question. Well, um, in some sense, our uh, cultural deserts are uh, what in some sense uh, are not related to urban centrality or marginality, it's really, about uh, what you make of it, because I, I, made, I made examples. You, you find incredible places which are completely marginal. And at the same time, you can find the urban poles that are completely shallow from this point of view. So it's really a kind of social dynamics. Well, I, I, I don't, you know, thinking of urban uh, cultural deserts, for example, is also, I mean, um, challenging from my point of view, because I start from the idea that sometimes maybe it's uh, us that who simply do not see what's really happening. Because I start from the fact that uh, every single human being is interested in stories, is interested in meaning, is interested in music. For example, there are places, uh, for example, in Italy, like Naples, where of course they are very lively from the point of view of cultural institutions. But if you simply look at that, you don't see an incredible amount of popular culture that has to do with uh, forms of popular literature or music or even visual arts that are completely under the radar. So when you consider, I mean, what's really going on in a place, you are in some sense filtering according to certain types of categories. So before defining what a cultural desert is or not, it's important also to stipulate uh, what do we mean uh, by relevant culture from this point of view. And sometimes it's really our inability 
to let's say to 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 hear certain types of voices this said i must admit that i have seen places where i didn't know where to look <laughs> that's true there can be places like that but i think it's also a form of perverse social dynamics that is created and this can happen equally i think in cities or in in the countryside or in the, in a desert lands, it really, but it, it doesn't have, I think, an urban specific. Uh, there is not something that is really linked to the density of uh, inhabitants or uh, the availability of services and so on and so forth. By the way, there is today a very popular theory, for example, in urban economics and sociology that says that the really, really interesting things can only happen in big cities because there is much more diversity. I totally don't buy this. Because uh, honestly, I don't think that's the case. I, I think that again, in certain time, in certain contexts, you can have certain types of dynamics, but in certain contexts, you don't. So, uh, and especially the idea that basically, if you live in the countryside, you, you you have no chance to really make a contribution to contemporary culture. That's the most stupid thing you can you can say. I, think. I, I absolutely don't buy this idea. If I if you don't mind, I'm going to combine two questions just to keep us moving. So Maria right. Markham asks, um, would you also talk about the role the individual artist has in this change? So from the individual, not the structural, but just from the individual artist perspective. So I think it kind of dovetails slightly, but a little different from the question by Christina Pico, which is, um, you were mentioning the monument to Gramsci of Thomas Hershorn, and you seem to have a clear opinion about it. Could you share with us what your opinion is, Mr. Pio? Sure. So Absolutely. those two. Absolutely. Uh, first of all, individual artists. Well, there is there can be a tendency to think that in some sense, uh, on the basis of what I said, that there's no future for individual artistry, but that's clearly not the case. I think that there is a role and this role is exciting as ever. Uh, the point is that uh, we have then there has been a tendency to think of the individual art, so to speak, uh, the artist as the soloist, as somebody who takes the scene and everybody else that is there and stares at the artist. Uh, and I think that the, the most correct metaphor today is the individual artist as the conductor. You have an orchestra and you have to make people play with you. That's much more exciting because that's not prejudicating in any way your creative abilities and your, your poetics but in some sense involving in a, in a process of co-creation also so many other people around you it's not a, again inevitable I, I think that even traditional studio art of course has a, is probably a bright future but i'm also saying that we are expanding dramatically the possibility for these new forms in which uh, the individual artist does not uh, in some sense lose individuality by participating, by sparking these new processes that are much more complex and much more, uh, let's say, uh, participative in the, in the literal sense. And um, uh, sorry, the second question was, I forgot. You it. think about Tomas Hirschhorn's Gramsci oh, yeah, 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 sorry. So Hirschhorn, um, we have, I mean, with, with uh, some uh, co-authors of mine, we have a paper. Wait, and wait, wait, sorry, sorry, before you go into it, for those that don't know, because I, I don't want to assume people know art worldy stuff. It's certainly a big complex world. Tomas Hirschhorn is a Swiss artist who often does these kind of large scale messy installations that reference theoretical Western continental philosophers. And uh, he did a project in New York called Mo Gramsci Monument, which was a certain kind of, um, he did different monuments to different people, but he did a monument to Gramsci uh, and you can go into it from there. Well, thank you very much. And you know, the interesting thing is this, Antonio Gramsci, by the way, is probably the most visionary and transformational thinker on this new role of collective agency through culture. Because uh, I mean, uh, in, in a period like, uh, let's say, during the years of fascism, he basically died in, in prison and he was incarcerated for the most part of his uh, active intellectual life. And uh, I mean, what we have from him is a legacy, an incredible legacy of uh, prison notebooks that basically are one of, are a testament of a visionary idea of the transformational role of culture, among other things. So in Gramsci idea, you can really, in some sense, uh, challenge uh, forms of, um, let's say, um, imperialism and, uh, and, uh, and uh, author authoritative control, not simply from the political point of view, but the symbolic point of view, through, uh, let's say, engaging in collective cultural agency. So that's an incredibly modern idea, if you think that that was uh, basically conceived in the 30s of the, of the 20th century. And so, I mean, 
it's really an icon uh, and uh, still, I, I think, and uh, let's say uh, overlooked thinker in this regard. So what, what uh, Tomar is sh shown that was to imagine um, this monument created in a neighborhood in the Bronx in which he recruited the local, uh, the local um, residents from, from, the, from, from the neighborhood, but on the basis of the idea that it, this was his project and it was the sole responsible in, in every moment in which there could have been a discussion on the, the purpose of the project and so on and so forth, he would have the last word. And the really interesting thing is that we have documentaries that show this very clearly because the irony is that a friend of, uh, of his that was uh, a schoolmate at the time of the art school, uh, Angelo Ludin, was authorized by, by Hirshhorn to shoot a documentary. And by the way, I spoke uh, at length with Ludin and he told me that what is shown in the documentary is one tenth of what really happened in terms of meaningfulness. And the really interesting thing is that you see really scenes in which you have uh, even practical discussion in terms of what to do. And Hirshhorn really using his authorship uh, as a sort of privilege to say, I am the artist. I say, this is the way we should go and now shut up. I mean, and this is a monument to Gramsci, not only, but the really interesting thing is that you create the monument, you invite who, of course, uh, lofty intellectuals from all over the world speaking about uh, colonization and so on and so forth, basically ignoring uh, the, the residents there that just uh, hung up. They were, of course, uh, happy to see these people uh, just, uh, just uh, moving around in the neighborhood because they never see anybody there. But at the same time, they were completely, let's say, left aside from this point of view. There was no real effort to really communicate to them who Gramsci was and what was the purpose of that. And when the, everything was over, the monument was uh, simply packed up and brought away in some other museum, which basically meant that the contribution of these people was cheap labor force, and at the same time, appropriation of the glamour of this peripheral identity to make this a social work. So, you know, that's one of the most horrific war forms of instrumentalization of radical thinking that I can think of. By the way, for anybody who is interested with this co-author, so mine, we have written a scientific paper that is now under review in a geography journal uh, on a detailed analysis of this case. So once uh, we are authorized to release, if anybody is interested, I will, of course, uh, circulate it. I, I, think I would love to hear comments. I love it. And thanks for the question, Christina. Uh, Christine, uh, uh, Christina, my bad, I'll keep it up. And um, I would love for um, two things I'll say. One, I feel like Thomas Hirshhorn kind of tipped his toe in his social gauge art. By the time he presented Gramsci Mania, it had gone miles ahead of him and he was, who was revealing his kind of cards. I do want Veronica, you raised your hand. You, can, you want to ask your question, Veronica? Sure. Thanks, Nato. Thanks, Pierre Luigi. It was a great talk. Um, I want two things. Going back to the Glamsky monument, actually, I attended the opening <laughs> to that whole ceremony. And what's key about this, that if people don't know, this monument was at a public housing project, predominantly yes. African American. Right. So this whole piece that you're talking about, like it's like an example of colonization. It's like the example of colonization in the epicenter of colonizing the disenfranchised, right? You're, you're putting this thing at a housing project and you're using their label for free. So it's another form of, in a way, like modern day slavery. But that's, an, <laughs> that's, that's not my question. My question is about actually, you use the word inclusion a lot, which I, I love that you're using that term. But the question is, you know, what is your definition of inclusion and what happens when inclusion comes to the point where you're including everybody and that becomes less effective? Thank you. That's, that, that's a fantastic question. Of course, that's an extremely difficult uh, issue because uh, you're absolutely right. It's easy to speak of inclusion, but what does it mean in practice? Well, personally, I think that in a moment like this, inclusion means prioritizing the people who have less voice. So uh, I could use uh, something uh, analogous to the political philosopher John Rawls. So uh, John Rawls had this uh, idea of writing a theory of justice. How can you define justice? And he, he came up with this incredibly interesting idea. Imagine that you are in an ideal state of the world in which you don't know what role you will have in society what would be the most, uh, let's say, uh, just way 
to define rights in a situation like this. And uh, he said that the most uh, you know, reasonable state of affairs is the one in which you improve as much as possible the well-being of the people who are, let's say, worse off. In some sense, this is my notion of inclusion. Uh, you can define inclusion in terms of how good are the people who are the, included the least. In some sense, in a situation in which you maximize the possibility of speaking their mind, of participating of the people who are included the least, that's an inclusive kind of a concept. Of course, you can always improve. There are trade-offs because to improve, for example, the possibilities for somebody, you're probably in some sense prejudicating the possibilities for somebody else, but some of these trade-offs are worth Worthwhile because in some cases there are people who really have no opportunity whatsoever to really speak their mind, to really participate. And so even if we are sacrificing in some sense the possibilities of someone else who are more entitled, well, that's probably that's probably a sensible way to include people. Uh, thanks, thanks, Veronica, for the question. And I, I must say too, I want to. I always feel like there's like a philosophy of things, and then there's like the study of how things get done, and. Uh, <laughs> You know, I know right now there's in the, in the political mood, there's a lot of projects that are very horizontal and very broad based, but they're also deeply ineffectual. And so, you know, I do think there's a misunderstanding of a good politics versus a practical sense of how things get done. Um, and I do think it's very uh, depressing for community members when they work on something that goes nowhere, um, which can also be a problem of process. I'm not to add my own two cents in there, but I just wanted to. Um, I want to go to um allison you have a question do you mind just asking it if that's okay rather than the, the, the sure cool. sure because i it was a little dense i was just sort of I, yeah. i'm responding to what you just said about this sense of justice and um and it's to me there's just something fundamental about what we owe each other as humans in a complex and um, overpopulated society. And I'm just thinking about what you're saying about cultural, the cultural importance and the value of it as being more important than economic. And don't we, how do you, how do you feel about what we owe each other in committing ourselves to developing culture? Isn't it, do you feel it's in any way an ethical responsibility for each of us to work, to contribute to a cultural environment because it's so much more valuable than the economic? Sure, no, absolutely. Uh, this has to do with the nature of communication. You know, uh, one thing that the neuroscientists today are starting to understand is something that seems so unproblematic and yet is so problematic, how people understand each other. I mean, we, we, for example, we know today that my notion of pencil, let's say, has to do with the individual pencils that I handled in my life. And of course it has to do with visual information with tactile, uh, haptic information, with uh, auditory information, the sound of the pencil on the paper and so on and so forth. But of course, if you never use the pencil or simply watch people using a pencil, your information is mostly visual, which means that in some sense, the notion of pencil is completely different from what my resources and your resources. But the point is, the more people start communicating, the more communication is effective if their cognitive maps align reciprocally. So the really interesting thing is that uh, human communication is about uh, creating a common space. And this common space is where understanding can happen. The really interesting thing is that uh, in the case of artistic and cultural expression, you are not communicating for pragmatic reasons. You are communicating because you, and that's basically John Dewey, you're communicating because you want to create a space in which you can, let's say, say everything that is beyond pragmatic, but at the same time becomes the basis to be really pragmatic because you understand what really matters for people. So there is an ethical responsibility because if you fail to do this, you are in some sense jeopardizing possibilities of human development and you have to take responsibility for that. And that comes back to what also Nato was saying. I don't think that we can be happy with stating bold intentions of transformational actions. This idea of, let's say, this posturing of certain types of radical artistic agency, 
which is just posturing because it comes so, I mean, it looks so nice. I hate it because that's basically fishing with bombs. You are destroying the social credibility of artistic practice. I think that artistic practice should be judged in terms of outcomes. So if you are just posturing, but you do not, do not take responsibility for the outcomes of your action, in some sense, you are, uh, you are prejudicating the social credibility of artistic action. So, and again, that's an, uh, that's an ethical point. So I there think that we I love have- it. I love that you're throwing down the gauntlet there, Pierluigi. The bar just Sorry? got raised. You threw down the gauntlet, the bar just got raised on the artists. All right. <laughs> well, you know, I, I think that uh, in some sense, uh, we have a much more responsibility than we think. And the fact that it's under-recognized doesn't, uh, doesn't make it less, uh, less important or less relevant. We, we have chosen the, the hardest, in some sense, the, the, the toughest path. And uh, of course, I mean, it's, uh, it's also very enjoyable. We have a lot of fun in it, but uh, still it's very tough no? in terms I, of training. I, love what you said. I think the idea of being responsible, even if no one else gives you responsibility, is a reasonable thing and to take it to take it's true that it does have an impact or not but the goal is to have an impact you know marx always said the goal of philosophy was to change the world not reflect on it that said his worst piece of writing was the piece that tried to change the world the communist manifesto uh, so i think the, the the ability to actually change the world is is not simple um and there again i gotta dig at marx okay so jay um I wanted to ask if you don't mind stating your question. We're gonna round out with you. I never like to overstay a welcome. My uh, director at Mass Mocha always said, leave people wanting more. We certainly could use more of you, Pierre Luigi. You've been so insightful and great. Jay, do you mind uh, chiming in? Can you state your question? Sure. Uh, uh, hi, Pierre Luigi, great stuff. Hi. Uh, so my question is this, um, I work as a, anyway, with a lot of workers in the United States. And uh, recently I went to an event uh, at a training center in Texas. And I was really struck by uh, how artistic the um, these heavy construction materials were put together and were designed. And so I'm doing artistic, and I was allowed to photograph inside. So I'm doing an artistic uh, project on that. My question is, um, we hear a lot about taking art to the community and following the community, but how about the just kind of, um, think it's a natural part of the human condition. Other people could disagree, but how about just kind of the way that uh, workers and uh, people in the lives produce art as part of this, the, the existential uh, activity of life? Wow, well, that's, that's a very good point. You know, the, the point is that we have a natural quest for meaning. And uh, we, in some sense, we, we, we are interested in producing something meaningful, even if uh, there is no specific uh, intentional drive for this. The point is that uh, in many cases, people um, in some sense uh, do not, uh, are not aware that this, this, this thing can really become something interesting. Again, if you lay bridges with other people can do with you. So what I really think should be interesting is not this rhetorics of, uh, let's say, community projects and involvement, uh, because it, in some sense, uh, legitimizes you. I mean, this, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, reference, this insistence on community, sometimes is just a way to say what I'm saying is right. Because I, if I speak in the name of the community, I mean, how can you deny that this is important? So the point is exactly the contrary is that how can I manage to give voice to them? How can I manage to give agency to them? I can do this in ways that are important for them. Because you know, the interesting thing is that uh, you can do something that you think is meaningful, also involving this kind of people, but it's not meaningful for them. I mean, how can this matter aesthetically? It cannot. It's, 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 again, it's a colonialist operation, even if you're not intentionally being colonialist. The point is, how can I spark a new form of agency that these people who are involved recognize is significant for them? Hey, Pierre Luigi, can I just dig at that a little bit? You know, like Paolo Freire in Pedagogy of the Oppressed, he did believe in an educator, even though it was that the, the, that the subject, the educated, did hold the seeds of their own self-education within them. It was the educator that allowed them to have the tools 
to deconstruct their experience and to repeat it together. And I do think sometimes, just to ask you, you know, sometimes when people make these projects for the art, for the community or they speak, they've not given a lot of tools to deconstruct their experience or to artistically present themselves. And I sometimes think artists sometimes under recognize these skills that they've learned through schools and stuff, but that knowledge is a skill, right? That these are tools and that they should not be taken as though they don't have value. So I'm wondering in terms of your reaction to what Jay said, how do you kind of think about knowledge as tools or deploying them so that people have agency to speak, but also have the tools to do so? Absolutely. You know, again, it's it's very much about, uh, you currently you currently pointed out, pointed out that uh, it's really a problem also power relationships. Uh, of course, I, I, I cannot help thinking of the Ignorat schoolmaster Jacques Rancière in this particular regard. It's really about how can you inspire people to, to act without constructing a power structure on this? You know, and that's the big contradiction. In some sense, we are not uh, mature enough for this, but this is where we are in some sense uh, groping towards. Uh, I personally think that uh, the essence of the digital revolution that we are witnessing is that it's creating an unprecedented possibility for uh, distributed intelligence and collective creation. But this is something that we are really just witnessing the very, very early steps like let's say the cinema of the of the 20s compared to today's cinema it's we are in the pre-cinema situation of the digital society and the problem is that if you look at how these models are developed so far they are a trivial extension of the traditional formats of cultural industry you have turned television into personal broadcasting think of how most people use social media so but this is not where we can go. This is not a real form of collective agency and a collective creation. It's just a way to personalize and appropriate the formats that were previously the privilege of a few, uh, again, uh, high-powered, uh, let's say, monopolists of sense-making and you make your own. Uh, we have to learn a new grammar from this point of view. And this has to do also with changing the models of what we mean by education and teaching. And, uh, and it's complicated. But for example, there are interesting experiments going on. Think of what's happening in Finland. The idea that, uh, uh, let's say, high school teachers are today negotiating with students strategies to cover the program in ways that are interesting from the student's point of view. And in some sense, uh, just giving up the authority of deciding what to do in the, in the best interest of the students. And uh, this is not in some sense, making students less motivated or lazy. This is making students immensely motivated because you know that, that's the point. I mean, as humans, we are interested in learning things that are interesting for us. The problem is interesting. <laughs> the problem I mean, is listen, I, must, I, I hear you. There's a guy named Jim Dugnan that runs a thing called Stockyard Institute. And if you think about schools in terms of power structures, how much of school is just reifying the non-power nature of children or students, just sucking power from them? My son's favorite day of the year is a holiday where he's the parent. Um, it's called parent day. And he puts us to bed and gets to be the charge. Why? Because they're so used to being taken power from them. And it's, it's a, you're right. And so much education is about you learning your place. Absolutely. No, I, I've just seen a mind blowing documentary from the seventies in Italy that was basically a adaptation of a autobiographical account of a, in this case, a, a elementary school teacher in a completely disenfranchised neighborhood in Rome, where most of the, most of the children came from totally dysfunctional families that didn't even come to school. And they started by, in some sense, renegotiating the presence of these people in the classroom by starting from their own everyday experience and their everyday experience, the only thing in common that they could find at the beginning was that they were all interested in torturing lizards. And they, but they started from there to understand what a lizard is and probably why it's so interested, the interesting that it's not worthwhile torturing them. And uh, just uh, moving from there, can you imagine? Of course, uh, it, 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 uh, it, uh, as you can imagine, it clashed with the power structure of the school and they, at the end he had to, to resign and so on and so forth. But it was from the seventies and the really, really interesting thing is that it was a detailed uh, representation 
of the nature of the interaction or the negotiation that happened between that school teacher and these people who do not, did not perceive themselves as pupils. And that was mind blowing because clearly this, there was a way to engage them in such a way that they were simply just uh, dropping lunches or whatever, because what they were doing at that point was highly meaningful for them. So, but this was by reneging authority, not just by enforcing authority. This can look like a platitude, but in the end, it's as simple as that. The only problem is to make it viable, sustainable, but that's the reason why, for example, I'm so a huge fan of Finland because they are managing to do this while at the same time really making students uh, able to reach brilliant goals and to excel in their fields and to, to create a new kind of knowledge society. I love it. Well, listen, we also love that you ended on the note of schools and education as you are our first visiting artist at the Alternative Arts School. Everyone, please join me in giving a warm thank you to Pierluigi Sacco. Thank you. Thank you so much, my friend. It means so much to have you with us. You've been incredible. I'm sure all of us are eager to talk with you again. We could go on a long time. Amber's excited. You mentioned Finland since she's there. Um, I also thought, Claire, there's a lot to be gained with your project around the kids destroying the house uh, and that so much. So it's been great. And Marinella, thank you for introducing and making that connection to Pierluigi. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. I can't promise they'll always be this good, but thank you, Pierluigi, for uh, being a part of our Visiting Arts Series. And uh, with, with Marinella, we, we, we're agreeing about uh, one diversion into our course sometime in the, in the fall. So if anybody is interested in uh, just... No, I have, I have the date. I have the date. Uh, wait, wait. I have the date. You are with us on October 4th. And right. building a community is the aesthetics of resistance. So for our, our artists that enroll it. No. All right. Well, listen. Bye, everybody. Bye, Pia Luigi. Bye, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. It's been wonderful. You're awesome. Okay. Thanks. Ciao. Thanks.